So let's go ahead and uh, start with a prayer. O oh, Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, guard in all places and fill us all things, treasury of good things and giver of life. Come and dwell in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, O oh, gracious Lord. Amen. So uh, tonight, uh, we're going to be picking up in uh, First Kingdoms or First Samuel uh, chapter 27 um, to get us caught up a little bit uh, in terms of uh, where we were uh, last month. Uh, David is uh, still on the run from Saul, although uh, last time we saw how uh, on two occasions, David had the chance to essentially take Saul's life if he had wanted to, if he had wanted to try to uh, take the kingship uh, by usurpation, uh, he had ample opportunity to do that, uh, but did not um, take those opportunities. And after the second one, uh, Saul uh, spoke very, very nicely to David and uh, seemed to say, well, you know, maybe I'm not going to continue to seek your life. Uh, but as we saw right at the end, uh, David still did not uh, take that opportunity to go back to Israel uh, because, as we're going to see wisely, he did not trust Saul uh, to keep to keep that promise. Uh, David has been anointed as king. Uh, he has been told he is going to be king, but uh, he is waiting patiently to let uh, God deal with Saul, uh, which God is doing. And as we talked about last time, uh, despite the literal atrocities Saul has committed uh, in his pursuit of David, uh, God is continuing to try to give Saul the opportunity to repent uh, and to turn back from the course of destruction he's on. Uh, we just haven't seen any real signs of Saul uh, doing that. And uh, not to spoil, but that's not going to change. Um, so that's sort of where we've, where we've been uh, recently. Uh, so uh, unless there are any uh, questions or comments uh, or anything left over from before, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, pick up in uh, First Kingdoms or First Samuel uh, chapter 27 verse 1. Father, one quick comment. I just wanted to say for anyone who is on, if anyone has a question, feel free to send it in the chat even during the main part of the Bible study and Father Stephen can always answer a question. Um, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, Father, but if you can do that even earlier. Yeah, yeah, Any, just go ahead and put it in the chat. And uh, as soon as I see it, uh, we'll get to it. <laughs> so, um, okay, so um, chapter 27, verse one, David spoke in his heart saying, now the day will come when I shall die by the hand of Saul and be added to my fathers. What is best for me is to be in the land of the Philistines where I will be safe. For Saul will stop searching for me at the borders. Then I will be delivered out of his hand. Um, we've already commented a couple of times that, and this is important, and this is going to continue to develop in David's life, that even though David uh, is going to be held up not only here in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, where he's the pattern for the Messiah. David has held up as sort of the ideal king, as a prophet, as a man after God's own heart. That doesn't mean he's perfect. He, we're going to see he's far from perfect. And we've already seen at a couple of points uh, some things uh, that should trouble us. We saw, I believe it was two studies ago, that uh, he now has more than one wife. Um, and that was sort of warning sign number one uh, that he has some weaknesses. Uh, this is big warning sign number two. Uh, because, of course, who has been keeping David safe all of this time? Has David thus far eluded Saul because, oh, he's just been more clever and been a step ahead of him? Uh, not really. In fact, uh, it's been God who's been protecting David all along. It's God who anointed David as king and told him he was going to be king 
And yet now David is thinking to himself, well, eventually Saul's going to kill me. Meaning eventually I'm, meaning he started to doubt whether he would ever be king. He is literally at this point doubting what God had said to him, doubting that God will take care of him. And so in his attempt to take care of himself, uh, he says, well, I'll go hide in Philistine territory uh, because Saul won't be able to go into Philistine territory looking for me because the Philistines are our enemies. Uh, and so he's trusting in sort of his own cunning and wisdom and indirectly in God's enemies uh, to try to protect himself rather than trusting in, in uh, God to protect him. Uh, we re have read already about several battles with the Philistines. Uh, there were many more before this, all through the book of Judges. Uh, the Philistines were a periodic problem during the time of various judges. Uh, but it's not that this was sort of one endless uh, fighting war for uh, centuries, for literally, you know, for 400 years uh, that we're talking about with the Philistines. Rather, they uh, had established borders. There were certain cities that were under Philistine control and the land between those cities. There were certain cities that were under Israelite control and the land between those cities. And there would be occasional conflicts at the borders that would be sparked by incidents where Israelites would be taking resources from what the Philistines considered their territory and vice versa or when one side or the other decided they wanted to expand their borders, there would be flare-ups of, of battle and combat along that border. But for the most part, uh, that even though they were enemies, those borders were accepted and secure. Uh, you might think of, for example, the Cold War in Europe, uh, where there were border checkpoints, there was an air of hostility, but there was not sort of open shooting warfare uh, at all times. And so there uh, were throughout the period uh, people going back and going back and forth across those borders, common people, farmers, workers, workmen, uh, of course, would migrate and move between this territory. Uh, there weren't really nation states and citizenship the way we think of them today. Um, it was more just sort of an, an area of control, an area over which a particular ruler could project, project his will. Uh, and it's also not coincidental that there's a parallel here. Uh, way back in the second Bible study when we were talking about giants um, and the giant clans, uh, we talked about how at the end of the book of Joshua, the sort of surviving members of the giant clans who uh, Joshua and Caleb the rest of the Israelites had managed uh, to remove, escaped and went and hid in Philistine territory. They went and hid from the Israelites there. And so the fact that David is here making the same decision uh, that, those, that those people did, uh, that the members of those giant clans did, is also supposed to telegraph to us here that David is not doing the right thing, uh, that he's starting to, uh, trust in himself and as we saw with the uh, beginning of the multiplication of wives he's starting to indulge himself um, and these are signs of trouble so verse two then david and the 400 men with him arose and traveled to achish the son of maach the king of god Remember, Gat, the city, is where Goliath was from. Uh, this is one of the uh, five major Philistine cities uh, and, is, and was at this time the largest uh, of the five. And David, David settled in Gat with Achish, he and his men, each with his family, and David with both wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelite woman, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. And it was reported to Saul that David had fled to God, so he no longer sought him. So 
David not only goes there himself, but he has these 400 loyal fighting men uh, who we've seen already uh, who are following him and David and his wives and those men and their families don't just go to hide there temporarily as sojourners, but they go and settle them. They go to live uh, in the area uh, under the rule of the, the king of God. And uh, when Saul finds out about it, predictably, he's not going to go and start a war <laughs> with, with the Philistines in order to try to get into their territory to find David. Uh, so he just uh, leaves off. But again, David is now putting his trust in this Philistine king uh, for his protection rather than, than God. Then David said to Achish, if your servant has now found favor in your eyes, indeed, offer to me a place in one of the cities in your country, and I will settle there. Why have your servant settle with you here in your royal city? And that day, Achish gave Ziklag to David. That is why Ziklag still belongs to the king of Judah to this very day. So uh, David then says to the king of, of God uh, that he wants to become his vassal. That's what's going on here. Uh, so God is the central city. It's the royal city. It's the city where the king lives, the center of his power and his military. Uh, David clearly has formed a relationship with him and refers to himself as his servant. And uh, he asks to be given a city of his own, uh, of one of the smaller towns controlled by, uh, controlled by Achish as the king of God, this Philistine king, uh, who does so, which again shows you that there's this reciprocal, reciprocal uh, relationship. Uh, this is another step worse than uh, just trusting in this Philistine king to protect him. Uh, the king of uh, Israel and later of Judah was seen to be uh, in a covenant with God himself. So Yahweh, the God of Israel, had a covenant with the king of Israel and he was, uh, the king was God's uh, vassal and was governing on God's behalf. So uh, David has not only shown here a lack of confidence in, um, in God's promise to protect him and bring him to the throne, but he's actually gone and formed this other relationship to give himself authority within the Philistine system over this Philistine city of uh, Ziklag. Now we're told here in this note at the end that what results out of this, what ends up happening out of this, is that uh, that city ends up becoming part of Judah later, <laughs> once David will become king. Uh, but David, of course, doesn't know have that purpose in mind uh, at this time. At this time, he's just decided that while well, Saul's trying to kill me, I'm going to make a life for myself here, since. Uh, being part of Saul's royal court didn't work out. Now the time David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was four months, and David and his men went up and attacked all the Geshurites and the Amalekites, indeed even against the tribes belonging to this area, and against the inhabited cities of Gelamshur, from the fortified cities as far as the land of Egypt. And he struck the land and neither man nor woman was left alive. He took away the sheep, the cattle, the donkeys, the camels and the clothing and came back to Achish. Then Achish said to David, where did you attack today? And David said to Achish, upon the south of Judah, upon the south of the Jezmega and on the south of the Kenites. And David did not leave man or woman alive to bring news to God, saying, Let them not inform on us to those in God by saying, Thus David did. This was David's behavior as long as he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So David had the full confidence of Achish, who said, David is now thoroughly abhorred by his own people. For having put Israel to shame, he will be my servant forever. And so, uh, in addition <laughs> right, to what David is doing, uh, he's also pulling a clever ruse 
uh, on Akish. Um, in that, David is taking his men and conducting raids and attacks. Uh, but if you notice who it is, it's the Amalekites, it's other tribes from those giant clans we mentioned. The, remember the Amalekites in particular are who Saul was supposed to complete uh, wiping out um, and didn't, instead took their king as a hostage and took their treasures for himself. And because he didn't do that, that's what brought the judgment against him in terms of losing the throne. So David is, uh, on the positive side, he is continuing to treat the enemies of God as his enemies. He's continuing to do what God wanted him to do. But while he's doing it, he's lying to the Philistine king. And when he says, well, where have you been attacking? Where have you gotten all these animals? Where have you gotten all this booty? He's saying, oh, well, I attacked Judah. And he's saying he attacked his his fellow countrymen uh, and that that's where he got it and so this is what is causing the philistine king to think ah okay well see he's really he's really turned he's attacking his own people he's serving me i could really trust him and he won't be able to turn on me and go back to his own people because they'll hate him for having attacked them and of course we're told here that david hasn't been attacking them at all uh so um, on the good side, <laughs> right, he's, the people who he's fighting are the people he should be fighting. On the bad side, he's still doing it to curry favor with this Philistine king. And this Philistine king of God should also be, uh, should be his enemy. And he should be uh, in Israel trusting in, in God to protect him uh, and bring him to the throne as he promised. So chapter 28, now in those days, the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle with Israel. And Achish said to David, know for sure you shall enter into battle with me, you and your men. And David said to Achish, thus you know what your servant will do. And Achish said to David, therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. Uh, so what's happening here is now one of these flare ups is happening. And the Philistine, particularly the Philistines of God, uh, are uh, getting ready to go to war with the Israelites. And um, so the king says to David, hey, I need you and your men, right? You're going to march against, against uh, the Israelites with me. David says, you betcha, <laughs> right? And uh, Achish, the king of, of God, says, well, you, if you do this, if you come and you fight with me against your own people, then know that I'm going to give you that when he says you'll be one of my chief guardians, this means uh, he would be one of the highest ranking members of his court, uh, potentially in line to succeed him if he didn't have a heir. Uh, so uh, this is what is on offer to David. And at least at this point, at this point in, in the narrative, uh, we don't know exactly what David's going to do because on one hand, he hasn't attacked Israel. Uh, he's been pulling the wool over uh, this king's eyes. However, in this case, he's gonna have to make a decision. He's gonna have to either, either turn on Achish, uh, the king of God, or he's going to have to fight his own people. So he's managed to keep this ruse going for four months, but now the time has come where he's gonna have to uh, permanently uh, choose a side. And the way the narrative here is sort of structured, now we get that from David, we don't know what he's going to choose, and the narrative sort of hits the pause button to tell us what's going on with Saul and Israel uh, at the same time in the story. So in verse 3, now it happened that Samuel had died and all Israel lamented for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul expelled those with divining spirits and the wizards out of the land. Then the Philistines came together and encamped at Shunem. So Saul collected all the men of Israel together and encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart was near panic. For when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him by dreams nor by clear signs nor by the prophet. So uh, 
we now switch over to see what Saul's doing and uh, Saul has a problem. <laughs> so his first problem is that Samuel, who was the prophet, the primary prophet, the last judge, the chief prophet has died. Uh, and there's, there's a subtle reference here uh, to the book of Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, where it forbids uh, the Israelites from participating in divination and uh, in consulting spiritists and that sort of thing. Um, it says uh, there's a promise there that God will send them a prophet. And that when they want to inquire of God, they need to go and inquire of the prophet. And he will tell them uh, what God wants them to know. Well, Saul doesn't have, doesn't have Samuel there anymore uh, to ask. Uh, we're also told that Saul has, and this was the correct thing to do, uh, according to the Torah, according to the law, he's expelled everyone who was involved in divination and witchcraft uh, from the land, meaning they've either left or they've been, they've been uh, killed for their crimes. Uh, the words here where it talks about wizards uh, in, in the, uh, the Orthodox study Bible, um, that there are there were two main ways that the divination took place in the ancient world. Uh, the first uh, was what is called extipacy. Uh, and what that was was uh, when a sacrifice was being offered, uh, sacrifices, as I believe you've talked about before, sacrifices were meals. And so uh, after the animal was killed, it and whatever else was being sacrificed, whether it be cakes or drink offerings or grain offerings, were taken and portions were taken for the priests, portions were taken uh, for the people who were bringing the sacrifice and portions were offered to God or to the gods, uh, depending on who it was who was offering the sacrifice. Well, in that process uh, of butchering the animal, when an animal uh, was about to be offered, uh, the entrails of the animal would be examined by uh, a particular type of priest who is called a haruspex. Uh, that's the Latin term for it because the Romans did this too. This happened throughout the ancient world. Uh, we have uh, from the Iron Age, from this time in history that we're reading about, uh, clay model, fired clay model livers and kidneys <laughs> with uh, writing on them uh, that describes what to look for in the different parts of the organ and what it means. Because uh, this was considered to be a way in which uh, the, the God to whom the sacrifice was being offered would communicate back to the people making the offering whether or not the offering was acceptable. Or in some cases, for example, if they were doing this offering right before they went into battle, there would be signs in the entrails, which of course only, only uh, a god could put there inside the animal. Uh, there'd be signs in the entrails that would indicate whether the battle would be successful or not, or whether they should retreat. Uh, and so it was the job of this haruspex, this particular priest to examine it and then inform, uh, inform the parties of making the offering of what was revealed there. And so there are accounts in the ancient world in Greece and Rome and Babylon and other places of certain times where some great tragedy was gonna befall uh, the empire or the city which was taking place. And there would be some odd thing that happened with one of the animals. For example, there was a, a bull that was killed uh, in Athens and when they were butchering it, it had no heart. And so that was this omen of doom <laughs> that was coming. Um, so that was one way. That was one way of doing it. Um, and that was, that was, of course, forbidden. So Saul didn't have that option of being able to uh, get one of the priests in the tabernacle to do that, because even if he managed to force them or threaten them into trying to do it, they didn't know how to do it. The, the Aaronite priesthood in God's tabernacle never learned how to read 
entrails uh, because that kind of divination was forbidden. So he didn't have that option available to him. The other primary type of divination was uh, through what the Greeks would and, and Romans would call oracles, most famous of which is the Oracle of Delphi. And these were uh, a sort of a form of prophet who would go into sort of a trance state and be possessed by the spirit um, of a god or another spiritual being and then would reveal some kind of truths through the person they were possessing. So the Oracle at Delphi was uh, possessed by Apollo and would give wisdom to people. Uh, we see sort of a small scale example of this in the book of Acts, where there's the slave girl who does fortune telling. And uh, when they cast the demon out of her, the owners are mad because that's how they made their money was by her telling fortunes through this demon who had possessed her. Um, and so uh, that practice obviously is also forbidden strictly uh, by, the, by the Torah. Um, and so there weren't any people practicing that left in Israel uh, for, uh, for Saul to consult. So, uh Saul because of his actions not just because of his disobedience uh to God uh and his refusal to repent but remember he slaughtered that whole town of priests of God um because of everything he's done God is now not speaking to him God is not now answering his questions uh and providing him information uh Saul of course is showing no desire to repent here He's not trying to return to God. He just sees a much bigger army lined up against him and is scared. And so before he goes into battle, he wants some kind of reassurance that God is going to fight on his side, even though Saul has repeatedly not been choosing, not been choosing God's side. So he now faces, he now faces this dilemma. And he has no reason to have any confidence going into battle because he's outnumbered and because of his own wickedness uh, and the things he's done. He has no reason to expect that God is going to show up and give him a miraculous victory over superior numbers. Uh, but rather than repentance, he's looking for uh, some kind of magical, magical answer. Then Saul said to his servants, seek for me a woman with a divining spirit. I will go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, in fact, there's a woman who is a medium at Endor. Uh, this is not the place where the Ewoks live. This is the city of Endor. Uh, as far as I know, it is a pure coincidence that those ended up with the same name, but you have to ask George Lucas uh, to be sure. Uh, but so what, what is Saul's solution to his dilemma? Again, not to repent, not to offer sin offerings, uh, not to invoke a period of repentance for his men before they go into battle in the hopes uh, that, that uh, Yahweh will fight for and defend them. His solution is, go find me a woman who's possessed by a spirit who can tell me secret mysteries, right? Uh, who could do this forbidden thing, go and find one. Even though I've tried to drive them all in the land, go and find one. His men tell him, oh, well, there's a woman who does that over here in this village, uh, Endor. Um, it's also, we should see as a bad sign, the fact that Saul's advisors all know where to find <laughs> a woman who's possessed and, and participates in divination. Uh, because this was just as forbidden, it was just as forbidden for them to consult her as it was for her to do what she did. Uh, but they apparently know immediately. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothing. He then went out, taking two men with him. And by night they came to the woman. And he said to her, indeed, by the divining spirit, tell the future to me when you bring up to me whom I tell you. So uh, Saul disguises himself. Uh, we'll see why here in a minute, but he disguises himself. He takes two of his men with him as bodyguards. 
They go to see the woman and he says to the woman, uh, I need you to tell me the future. He says, so, so use the spirit who's possessing you to summon up the spirit of the person who I'm going to tell you. So uh, Saul is not just consulting with the unclean spirit who possesses this woman, he's trying to use that unclean spirit to perform an act of necromancy. <laughs> so he's sort of doubling down here. Um, he's trying to additionally consult with the, uh, the spirits of the dead. Um, this is how far gone uh, Saul is. Now remember uh, when, we first, when we first saw him in the first uh, Bible study with David when the kingship was removed from him, uh, the Holy Spirit left him and he received this unclean spirit that was troubling him. Remember, it was torturing him at first. And we talked about how God was allowing that in order to try to bring Saul to repentance. Uh, and now we see uh, Saul not being all that troubled at all, not because the unclean spirit has left, but because now he's sort of formed this allegiance with these kind of spirits. Uh, so it no longer troubles and bothers him. So he's continuing to sort of sink into, into sin and madness uh, as we go. Then the woman said to him, look, you know what Saul did and how he cut off the diviners and the wizards from the land. Why do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to be put to death? Right, so this is why Saul disguised himself. The woman says, hey, you know the king has forbidden what you're asking me to do. So why are you coming here trying to get me to do it? Uh, you know, when this, this could get me killed. Uh, so this is, the, this is the Iron Age version of, hey, are you sure you're not a cop, right? This is, um, you want me to do this, this thing that's gonna have these horrible consequences for me. Uh, you know, what, what's your game? Are you up to something here? Are you, are you, you know, one of his hunters out looking for people like me? Um, I'm not going to fall for it. And Saul swore to her saying, as the Lord lives, no injustice shall come upon you for this action. So as the Lord lives is as Yahweh lives. So he's the only time we see him actually invoking uh, the name of God is to swear. Uh, and, and he invokes the name of Yahweh to swear that he's not going to do what Yahweh commanded him to do, uh, to swear that he's not going to follow, follow the law, follow the Torah. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. And so... It's hard to know at this point in his madness what's going on in Saul's mind. Uh, and whether maybe he thought, well, Samuel is the one who's supposed to speak to me on behalf of God, but he died. So I need to get him summoned up so he can speak for God to me. Like, as if that would make it better what he was doing or mitigate it somehow. Or if it is madness, who knows? Um, but uh, obviously, this is a this is a bad this is a bad plan <laughs> uh, that he's enacting here. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, "Why did you deceive me? You are Saul." But the king said to her, "Do not be afraid. What did you see?" And the woman said to him, "I saw gods ascending out of the earth." So he said to her, what did you perceive? And she said, a man is coming up, standing upright, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul discerned it to be Samuel. And he, stopped, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down to him. Okay, so um, a, little bit of a, a little bit of a digression, but we need, um, we need a little bit of background here to sort of understand to understand what's going on. Um, there's probably a number of things uh, that you may find troubling about this passage. Uh, for example, her talking about gods in the plural, <laughs> coming, coming up from the ground, 
uh, the idea that we apparently have Samuel back from the dead <laughs> um, with this witch, uh, that she, uh, interestingly, as soon as she saw Samuel, immediately knew who Saul was. Uh, and sort of just in general, what is, what is going on here? Um, and uh, I'm gonna have to digress a little bit in terms of background uh, in order to get us there, but I promise uh, I will loop around and get us there. <laughs> so there's a couple of things uh, where we in our modern culture as Christians have been sold a bit of a bill of goods. Uh, they're misunderstandings that we have in our head about ancient religion, including uh, the religion of ancient Israel. And, uh, and there are even sort of misunderstandings of the Bible. And what has caused these is a couple of things. Um, the biggest framework is that we don't talk about angels and demons much. Um, as someone who's gone to seminary, actually a couple of them, uh, <laughs> the, the sections of theology classes on angels uh, are, are brief at best and demons a lot of times even briefer. Uh, and so it's something we haven't really studied, we haven't really thought about. Um, in some cases, because we're sort of modern people, uh, we're kind of embarrassed of the idea of angels and demons running around. Um, and the sort of supernatural stuff, we kind of want to minimize it because we, we're afraid people will think we're weird. Uh, but uh, in order to understand what's going on in the scripture, and in fact, in order to understand what's going on, on in a lot of the hymnography of our church, uh, we have to we have to do a little better than that and try to understand some of these things the way ancient people understood them. Uh, so the the first the first obstacle the first problem we have to get over, uh, and this is related to her use of the term gods, um, is that uh, we have in our heads uh, we think of religions in terms of monotheism and polytheism and uh, that ancient Israel and Judaism and Christianity and Islam for that matter are monotheistic religions and then we have uh, ancient paganism uh, was polytheistic and our, under our definition of monotheism is someone who believes that there's only one God who exists and our definition of polytheism is somebody who thinks that a whole bunch of gods exist. Um, so right off the bat, everything I just said there was using terms and categories that did not exist before the 17th century AD. Uh, these are terms and understandings that were coined in Western European Protestant circles. Uh, after the end of the Thirty Years' War. So the first one of those terms is the idea of a religion. So you have in the ancient world people talking about religion, but they don't talk about a religion. When they talk about religion, they're talking about piety or religious practices or rituals, things that you do in relationship to God or the gods. That, so they would talk about religion, but they didn't have any concept of religions, plural, or a religion. I practice the religion of Judaism. This person practices the religion of Christianity. This other person practices the religion of Hinduism, the way we think of it today. Uh, and the reason why that didn't exist is because there was no concept of uh, religion as separated out from politics, or culture, or language. These weren't seen as being these separate spheres that interacted or didn't interact with each other. These things were all together. They're all the warp and woof of the way that people lived. And so uh, there was no concept of people having different religions or of converting uh, from one religion to another. Uh, those, those concepts didn't exist. But after the Thirty Years' War between uh, Roman Catholics and Protestants uh, in Europe in the 17th century, 
they had to form a peace. And part of forming that peace was separating out religious identity from political identity and other forms of identity. So that we could say, well, this person is a Protestant, uh, that person is a Catholic, this other person is Jewish, but we're all Prussians, or we're all French, or we're all Germans, or we're all English. So those things were separated out and pulled apart. Religion was moved to this other sphere, largely because they were trying to find a way not to fight it. <laughs> and not to see the person who disagreed with me religiously as the other. We're still connected by our nationality, by our political identity, even though we have different religious identities. But before that, that simply didn't exist in me. So the concepts of monotheism and polytheism, and there are other categories, um, were then later categories once again in Western Europe, people began to study religions. And so now we need to categorize and classify different religions. So one of the ways they were categorized or classified was monotheist or polytheist. With this idea that someone who is a, a monotheist believes that other, other gods are fictional. Um, and this is so firmly embraced that you'll sometimes hear atheists say to Christians, well, I just believe in one less God than you do, right? Because that's their idea of, of the Christian framework. Uh, this, this isn't, this isn't the, the understanding uh, of the biblical authors or, or anyone else uh, in the ancient world. Uh, so the, the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, are replete with mentions of gods in the plural. There are all kinds of mentions of divine plurality. Uh, and that's not something, um, what causes a lot of tension here is that there are a lot of very liberal scholars who want to say, oh, well, Israel wasn't monotheistic, it was poly polytheistic, so using these same categories. And so the conservative scholars will want to argue back against them and say, no, no, they were monotheists, not polytheists. And so because they're using those categories, they just get locked into this endless battle. So any passage in the scriptures that refers to gods in the plural, the liberal scholars will say, okay, well, this is proof that Israel was polytheistic. And they'll usually argue that, oh, well, they became monotheistic later on. There was this, this evolution of their belief. That is very easily proven to not be true. Uh, because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are two types of documents. There are uh, copies of books of the Bible and copies of other books that aren't in the Bible, like the Book of Jeb Jubilees or, or First Enoch, on the one hand. And then there are what are called sectarian documents, meaning just the books, the, the things that were written by the people at Qumran who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls that were just for them. And if you read the documents that were just for them, and so these are in the time leading up to and the first century AD, uh, there are more than 180 references to gods in the plural in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the sectarian documents. Um, and so these are Jewish people living near the time of Christ. That's actually more, that means if you just do word counts on the references, references to gods in the plural were more common in the Dead Sea Scrolls than they are in the Old Testament. There were more of those references, not less. Uh, so if we take those categories out of our head and sort of start over, we have to look at how the Israelites understood, uh, understood these things and how that compared to the way the surrounding cultures, like the Philistines we've been reading about, how they understood, um, how they understood these things. And there are uh, similarities and differences, but those similarities and differences don't boil down to, we believe in one God and they believe in a whole bunch. So in, in both cultures, in, in paganism and in ancient Israelite religion, there are a multitude of spiritual beings, right? what, we would, what we would call 
uh, now angels or demons, right? And God, in the case of the Israelites, and just gods in general in the pagan situation. But within the Old Testament scriptures, they use that same terminology. They use the term gods to describe those angels and demons uh, in the same way that the, that the pagans would. So you find, for example, in the Psalms, all the gods of the nations are demons. <laughs> Doesn't say all the gods of the nations don't exist. Um, it's just identifying what type of spirits they are. So within both, uh, there is the concept of a most high God. And then there is a concept of a council of gods uh, underneath. Now, in the case of pagan religions, usually uh, those multitude of gods underneath are literal descendants of the most high God. And usually that most high God has a wife. Um, and so the, that most high God has a wife, he has a bunch of kids, and those, those kids make up the council of gods. Now that's obviously not the case in, in Israel. Uh, in Israel, there is still a most high God. There is still Yahweh. He has a council of small g gods or angels or spirits, whatever term you're more comfortable using. Because uh, I know using the term gods in terms of the Bible is uncomfortable, even though that's the term it uses, uh, who are underneath. But he has created all of them. God has created all of the other, Yahweh has created all of the other spiritual beings, which means right off the bat, there's a fundamental difference between Yahweh and all the other ones, in that he is uncreated, and they are, and they are created which is very different than what you find in paganism, even though the structure of having this council is the same. Uh, the, other, the other thing that's important is that uh, within the concept of that most high God, uh, in the pagan world, there's the most high God, and then he has a son who presides over the council, uh, who is sort of a special son or a son in a unique way. So if we're talking about uh, the Phoenicians, that's El and his son Baal. If we're talking about the Egyptians, that's Re, the sun god, and Horus. Uh, if we're talking about the Greeks, that's Cronus and Zeus. Uh, and this is true across the board. You've got Marduk in, in Babylon. Uh, and these are two separate, these are two separate uh, divine beings. You find the same structure throughout the Old Testament in Israel, but in this case, in, in the case of the Old Testament, and I'm not going to be able to make this whole case now because it would take more than the rest of the Bible study, um, but I've talked about this a lot on my blog, but in, in the case of in Israel, both the Father and the Son are Yahweh. I'm talking about the Old Testament here. I'm not talking about just the New Testament. Both the Father and the Son the Father who's the Most High God and the Son who presides over the council are both Yahweh. And the second figure, the Son, God the Son, Yahweh the Son, in the Old Testament appears all through the Old Testament as the Word of God, as the angel of the Lord, as the commander of the Lord's hosts, uh, over and over and over again. And... Uh, what St. John is picking up on in the prologue to his gospel, when he says, no one has seen God at any time, but the unique God who is at his side has made him known. He's saying all those times when someone saw God in the Old Testament, that that was God the Son, that was the Logos, that was the Word of God who they saw. And that's who became incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. So they, they, they um, in a way, you have the same structure with Israelite religion as with pagan religion, except in Israelite religion, it's not these two different gods. It's Yahweh, and Yahweh is two persons, father and son. Uh, and then there is this, and then there is this council. Uh, so the last, the last piece of this that's really important uh, is 
about those people, not people, sorry, those, those spirits, the small g gods, the people who are the members of God's divine council. Because of course, they're not sort of separate gods to be worshiped as they are in the pagan world. I mean, we're all familiar with sort of the pan Greek pantheon or the Egyptian pantheon and how that works. Uh, but the way they're presented, the way they're presented in scripture is that, I'll back up just a second. We talked about the giants in our second Bible study. We, uh, and I believe I mentioned at the time, the second misconception that we have in our heads is uh, many of us uh, were taught the idea that sometime before the world was created, the devil and some percentage of the angels rebelled against God and fell into sin. That is nowhere in the Bible and nowhere in the prophets. That comes from John Milton, the Puritan writer in the, <laughs> in the 17th century wrote Paradise Lost. Uh, what, what the scriptures of the fathers present is that there are uh, three sort of angelic rebellions. The first one is the devil, that happens in Genesis 3, when he's cast down to the earth uh, in Genesis 3. Then there's, we talked about the giants and the, and the Nephilim uh, in the second Bible study. Uh, the third one happens after the Tower of Babel in, in Genesis 11. So Genesis 1 through 11 uh, is really the story of these three, these three spiritual rebellions and human beings joining in those spiritual rebellions. So what happens at the Tower of Babel is, um, and the Tower of Babel is not only described in Genesis 11, it's interpreted in Deuteronomy 4 and in Deuteronomy 32. It talks about when God divided the nations. Um, but what happens at the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel is a ziggurat, it's a temple uh, that the, the king of Babylon was attempting to build. And he was attempting to uh, draw God down and place him in an idol in this temple so that he could be controlled and manipulated, right? That's what it meant that he's trying to build a tower into, that would reach to heaven. This is what St. Paul is referring to when he says, do not say who will ascend up to the heavens for us, that is to bring God down, uh, because that's what they were trying to do. And so God responds according to Deuteronomy 32 eight, when he divides the nations, by stepping back from his creation. And he assigns these angelic beings who he's created to govern his creation while he takes a step back from all the nations. He then creates Israel and it's in and to and through Israel that God then re-engages with the world and enters back into the world. First in the, in the tabernacle and the temple, and then of course, preeminently in Christ's incarnation, right? He comes back to the world and ultimately after Pentecost comes back to the nations beginning with and through, through Old Testament Israel. But so there, the, these angelic spirits were assigned to the nations. They were assigned to the stars and the sun and the moon and all the other features of creation. And you find this in, in places in the scriptures and in all kinds of Jewish sources uh, all through history and early Christian sources talking about the angel of fill in the blank, right? The angel of this feature or this place or that. Uh, specifically with the nations, Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 says that when God divided the nations, he numbered them according to the number of the sons of God. That's in the Hebrew. In the Greek, it has, he numbered them according to the number of his angels. Uh, and those angels are particularly the members of this council who were, numbers are tricky in the Old Testament because they didn't have numerals. It's either 70 or 72 uh, beings were in this divine council. And it's not a coincidence that in Genesis 10, when it lists all the nations of the world in Noah's genealogy, there are 70 nations. And when Moses appoints elders over the people of Israel, he appoints 70 or 72 elders because the elders of Israel are this mirror. The elders around Moses are this mirror of, of the council around, 
Christ or on the word of God in heaven on earth. This is why there are 70 or 72 apostles who Christ appoints and sends out. And we talk about the apostles of the 70. Um, that's the significance of, of that number 70, right? Is it's the number of these, these beings. So these beings to whom the nations were assigned, and there's a, there's a, a beautiful icon that you can find pretty quickly searching on Google. Uh, an, an orthodox icon of the Tower of Babel. And what you see is you see people from all different nations, including because it's an icon that was painted relatively recently. Um, it's, uh, it has someone clearly from China, someone clearly from you know, various, uh, various other cultures, and they each have an angel uh, around their head. Um, so uh, that's depicting exactly what Deuteronomy 32 is talking about. That they had these angels assigned to them. Uh, we see these angels pop again, up again in the book of Daniel, but we can see already in Daniel that something has happened. Uh, because when uh, the archangel Gabriel comes to Daniel to deliver one of his messages, he says he was delayed because he had to do battle with the prince of Persia, right? Who is this? this spirit who is presiding over the Persians. Now, two problems. The Persians are Zoroastrians, right, in terms of their religion. So they're practicing a form of paganism. And this prince of Persia, right, this spirit assigned to Persia, is trying to oppose the Archangel Gabriel. And the Archangel Gabriel at that point in Daniel also talks about the prince of Greece who has come. Uh, which refers to uh, Alexander, Alexander the Great. So what has happened is that many of these spirits who God had assigned to govern the world when he stepped back have not only begun to be worshipped by the other nations as gods, uh, but they've begun to accept that worship. They've rebelled and they've become wicked themselves. Uh, and so... This is, these, these spirits are the ones who, when St. Paul talks about powers and principalities in the heavenly places as our enemies, this is who he's talking about. And you may not have noticed that he says powers and principalities in the heavenly places. He isn't talking about angels who fell and are in hell some long time ago. He's talking about these, these beings. Um, the, the judgment of these beings is described in what is Psalm 82 in the Hebrew, Psalm 81 in the Greek, uh, which begins with God taking his stand in the council of the gods. And among the gods he renders judgment, he talks to them about how they were to render justice and to do good. And instead they have practiced wickedness. And so even though they were called gods, they would die like men. And uh, so there's this pronouncement of judgment against them. And the last verse of that psalm is, Arise, O God, and judge the earth, for you will inherit from all the nations, which is what we sing on Holy Saturday as we begin to celebrate Christ's resurrection and the harrowing of hell, that Christ has defeated these spirits. This is what he's referring to in Matthew when he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. Right? So he's... He's displaced um, and taken away the power uh, of those beings. And so this is what uh, St. Paul's talking about when he talks about how Christ on the cross publicly exposed and stripped away the power of the powers and principalities. Uh, this is what he's talking about to the Gentile converts when he talks about how in the past they were enslaved through their idolatry, but now uh, Christ has set them free. Uh, to serve the risen Lord. Uh, this is what's going in, on in the background of, of all that. Uh, so the position of the scriptures is that those gods exist, but they are beings created by the true and living God, by Yahweh, by the, the Holy Trinity, uh, who is unique, right? And, uh, and are not to be worshiped as God and will be judged by him in the same way that, that uh, humans will uh, as his creation. 
This is why one of the one of the prayers that the priest says at Vespers uh, says about uh, the Holy Trinity, uh, you alone are God, and who among the gods is like you? Which on the face of it kind of makes no sense, right? You're sort of saying you're the only God, and none of the other gods who apparently don't exist are like you. Well, obviously they're not like you if they don't exist. <laughs> so that's not what it's saying. The idea is, yes, there are these other spiritual beings, but none of them is even in the same category as the true God right, who, who created them. And this is all through our hymnography uh, and all through uh, um, when we sing, uh, who is uh, so great a God as, as our God, <laughs> right? Uh, when at the Passover, God says, uh, Yahweh says, now I'm going to pass judgment on all the gods of Egypt, right? <laughs> um, that's not fictional characters. He's not saying, you know, look how much more powerful I am than the members of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? <laughs> Who don't actually, exist. well, yeah, of course he's more powerful than fictional characters. Um, no, this is, he's judging these, these, other, uh, these other spiritual beings. And so the term, in Hebrew, Elohim, or uh, the plural of Theos, uh, Thei, in Greek, uh, we see the word God and we think of Yahweh, we think of the Holy Trinity, we think of the one God, right, who is God and who is alone to be worshipped. Okay. But that word in Hebrew or Greek does not imply all that. Uh, both of those words are used just to refer to spiritual beings. Uh, so uh, Elohim or Thei can refer to uh, angels, demons, to uh, the true God himself, uh, to the spirits of uh, deceased persons, right? to Samuel, <laughs> right? um, and, uh, and uh, this is their normal, their normal way of talking. Uh, so when she says that she sees gods coming up out of the earth, she's referring to spirits. She's referring to, to uh, spiritual beings, of which Samuel is now one because he's uh, departed. He's departed from the body. Uh, so I know that was a long digression to get here, but I think that's important background in terms of Israelite uh, religion. Um, to um, to have that in the back of our heads through everything we read and through church services as well, but also to sort of understand uh, what's going on here. Um, so it was was asked whether it would be a better translation to say I saw spiritual beings and not gods. Um, I saw gods is a very literal translation, uh, but yeah, there's we're not used to talking that way. Um, I think it better though, rather than, rather than conforming the translations to the kind of stuff we've been taught and have in our heads, I think it's actually better for us to change some of the stuff we have in our heads. Um, because there's all kinds of places where this will help us. Um, sort of the, 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 the way when someone when we're reading an Orthodox source or an Orthodox teacher quotes St. Athanasius, you know, God became man so that men might become gods, <laughs> right? <laughs> Small g. Um, people like go crazy, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, well, well, no, we're not Mormons, right? No, we don't mean, we need this, we don't need that, meal, right? But, but when St. Athanasius said that, it was, it was totally clear, right, what, what he meant, right, in terms of this. So, I think we need to get rid of some of that, some of these, what are frankly 17th century Protestant categories um, that we still have in our head to get closer to, um, to what's going on, uh, what's going on in the scriptures. Uh, so she sees these spirits, one of them she describes, and Saul identifies this as uh, Samuel himself, who is the one who he at least thought he wanted to talk to, although we'll see that will probably turn out not to be the case. 
So verse 15, now Samuel said to Saul, why did you trouble me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed. The Philistines are making war against me, and God has departed from me. He does not answer me anymore, neither by the hand of prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I summoned you to tell me what I should do. <laughs> now, the, the irony here is that uh, part of the condemnation of divination in the Torah in Deuteronomy is that you don't participate in divination you go to the prophet and the prophet is supposed to call you back to the Torah, right? What is Saul supposed to do? Well, he as the king of Israel was supposed to have made by hand his own copy of the Torah and to have meditated on it day and night. So he should know exactly what to do. He should know that he should be repenting of his sins. He should know that he should be uh, turning back to Yahweh himself. And that then once he had done that, once he and his men and the people had repented, God would fight their battles for them. He should know that, right? That's what he should do. Uh, and so he's participated in this act of divination in order to have Samuel basically tell him, uh, don't participate in acts of divination, <laughs> right? That's what he should do. He should not be doing what he's doing right now. And then Samuel said, why do you ask me when the Lord has departed from you and is with your enemy?" And as the Lord spoke to you by my hand, he is done. For the Lord will rend the kingdom out of your hand and will give it to your neighbor David. For you did not heed the voice of the Lord nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. This is why the Lord has done this to you today. And the Lord shall deliver Israel, including you, into the hands of the Philistines. Tomorrow you and your sons with you shall fall. The Lord will deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. So this is not what Saul was hoping to hear, obviously. Uh, and there's no if, there's no unless, right? Samuel is saying, look, I already told you, right? Uh, God is not going to fight for you. In fact, Saul has made himself God's enemy. Saul has made himself God's enemy. And so now God is going to actively fight against him. He's going to be fighting on the other side. Not only is he not going to be uh, on Saul's side, now, this was announced by Samuel all the way back when we first started reading that the kingdom was going to be taken away from Saul. Now Samuel's saying, now's the time. This is it. This is it. As we've said before, though, he's still being told this. He's still being told this. Uh, Samuel still comes to tell him this, which means what? Well, Saul hasn't died yet. He may be about to, but he hasn't died yet. Meaning he can still repent. He can still turn. Even though that's not announced here, he could. God still has a messenger coming to Saul to tell him what the consequences of his evil are going to be. That gives him an, another chance, in this case, the final chance to turn, to turn back. Um, just as a side note here, uh, sometimes people will say that they don't think this is really Samuel, <laughs> right? Because someone could come back from the dead. Uh, the problem with saying this isn't Samuel and saying it's some kind of demon disguised as Samuel or something is that, he, is that uh, Samuel says the name Yahweh about five times in what he just said, which is not a name that you hear demons speaking out loud at all. Uh, in fact, when, when demons talk to Christ, when he's about to cast them out in the Gospels, what do we see? They call him the Son of the Most High, right? They just refer to him by that title. They know who he is and refer to him by that title, but they don't say the, they don't say the name of the Lord. They don't even really say his name. They say Son of the Most High. Uh, so that would be very unlikely. It seems that this is, this is Samuel. This is Samuel himself still speaking for, for God and pronouncing judgment. Saul fell prostrate on the ground for he was very afraid because of Samuel's words. He was also weak since he had not eaten any food all that day and night. Then the woman came to Saul and saw his weakened condition. So she said to him, behold, when your handmaiden heard the sound of your voice, I put my life at risk and I obeyed the words you spoke to me. Now hear the voice of your handmaiden and let let me set a piece of bread before you, 
eat and you will have strength when you go on your way. But he refused to eat. So his servants together with the woman urged him and he heeded their voice. He then arose from the ground and sat on the chariot bench. Now the woman had a heifer rowing the pasture. She hastened and killed it. Then she took flour and kneaded it. And from it she baked unleavened bread. And she brought it before Saul and his servants. They ate and departed that night. So uh, again, he's given this last chance to repent. He's told, you and your sons are going to die in battle. In this battle against the Philistines. The kingdom is going to be taken from you. This is it. Rather than repenting, he gets scared. And what does he do? Well, he reassures himself by having this nice meal with a demon-possessed woman. <laughs> accepting her hospitality and sitting down and sharing a meal, a meal with her. Uh, and so even this last chance doesn't click, right? It, he doesn't, doesn't understand. He doesn't turn back. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't repent. Um, let's go ahead. You said we were going to go through chapter 29. Chapter 29, verse 1, all the encampments of the Philistines gathered at Aphek, and the Israelites encamped in Endor and Jezreel. And the captains of the Philistines passed in review by hundreds and by thousands. David and his men passed in review at the rear with Achish. Then the captains of the Philistines said, who are these passing by in review? And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel? the one who has been with us daily for the last two years. I have found no fault in him from the day he defected to me until today. So uh, they're preparing for battle. Part of preparing for battle in the Philistine encampment is uh, they're surveying the troops, meaning the troops are marching past in formation. They're making sure everyone is in formation, that everyone is there, that everyone is properly equipped, that discipline is there. Uh, this would have also uh, been a little bit like a, a parade uh, in the sense that uh, this would be intended to sort of inspire uh, uh, team spirit isn't the right word but to to uh, to draw them together and get them fired up for the battle that's about to come right and uh, to take into account their own numbers uh, and this kind of thing and so while this is happening some of the Philistine commanders see hey wait a minute isn't it that one guy leading those men? Isn't that David, right? Isn't he one of them? Isn't he one of the enemy? Uh, what, what's he doing here in our ranks? And uh, the king says, well, he's been living with us all these months, and he's been a loyal servant, uh, so I trust him. But the commanders of the Philistines were grieved because of him, so they said to him, return the man to the place you appointed for him. Do not let him go with us into battle for fear that he become our adversary in the battle. For what better way could he have to reconcile himself to his Lord, if not with the heads of these men? Is this not David, about whom they sang in dances, saying Saul slew his thousands, and David his tens of thousands? Right? They said, listen, uh, this guy <laughs> is sort of famous for killing Philistines, and it's probably not a good idea to trust him. Right? Because if nothing else, you say, oh, yeah, the king hates him, and he's been conducting these raids against Judah. So the people of Judah hate him. Um, and uh, But if he's trying to get back in good, maybe he wants to return. Maybe he wants to make an impression. Him turning on us in battle and giving the victory to Saul would be a pretty good way for him to make friends with, with Saul again, uh, if that's what he's looking to do. So why don't you just send him home? It's him and 400 guys. We've got a big enough army. Why take the risk? And Achish called David and said to him, Surely as the Lord lives, you have been upright with me in the camp and good in my sight, and both your going out and your coming in. To this very day I have found no evil in you since the day of your coming to me. Nevertheless, you are not favored in the sight of the lords of the Philistines. Therefore return now and go in peace. Thus you shall not do evil in the sight of the lords of the Philistines. So David said to Achish, But what have I done to you? And from the day I came up to you to this day, 
What in your servant have you found that I may not fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Then Achish answered to David, I know that you are good in my sight. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. Now rise up early in the morning, you and your servants who came with you, and go to the place I established for you. Do not keep an evil thought in your heart, because you are good in my sight. And rise early in the morning and depart at first light. So David arose early, he and his men, to depart and to guard the land of the Philistines. The Philistines went up to battle at Jezreel. And so that's where we'll leave off for tonight. So David says, look, you know, have I ever been disloyal to you at all? And Achish says, no, but look, I'm not in charge of the whole army, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, they're not going to accept you. They're not going to trust you. So uh, just go ahead and head home. Now, this leaves ambiguous what David might have done if he had gone into battle, um, whether he would have turned on the Philistines, whether he would have fought his own people. Um, and uh, again, this is, this is one of the reasons why we started with the life of King David, is that the scriptures present to us I mean, this is unique in the ancient world. Uh, in the ancient world, you have two kinds of writings about kings. You have basically hagiography talking about how this was the greatest king who ever lived and everything he did was wonderful and perfect and on the one side. And then on the other side, you have this king was wicked and evil and got what he deserved and we all hate him. Usually written by somebody working for the next king who killed him. Uh, but we don't get that with David. Uh, what we get with what we get with David is this very human and nuanced picture of a person who was uh, in most of his life attempting to follow God, but was also deeply flawed and a sinner, and who made bad choices uh, and sometimes did things that are kind of morally ambiguous, uh, and he would face the consequences of those later. So we've started to see tonight that David, uh, while certainly not in a self-destructive spiral of madness like Saul, uh, does have his flaws uh, and his weaknesses and his feet of clay uh, himself that he's going to have to uh, deal with as we go forward uh, and as he becomes, uh, he becomes king. Uh, so uh, that's where we'll leave off in terms of the story. Let me see what we have in terms of uh, questions. Uh, so the question, you describe the process of animal sacrifices in the ancient world, the sign courses of people, does the prothesis, their preparation for communion have its origins with this? Um, yes, in fact, uh, the place, the place uh, where uh, in uh, Greek temples, they took the animal uh, in order to uh, do the butchering and separate out the parts and prepare it uh, for the offering was called the prothesis. That's where we get the name uh, for the table. Um, the, our, our divine liturgy is composed of two parts. Um, we usually call the first part the liturgy of the word and the second part the liturgy of the sacrament. Uh, but what these really are is uh, the first century Jewish synagogue service, in the case of the Liturgy of the Word, and, uh, a, uh, and, and the sacrificial ritual of the Jewish temple, in the case of the Liturgy of the Sacrament, uh, quite directly. So, for example, uh, in our first part of the, the Divine Liturgy, uh, we have the procession, the little entrance, the procession with the Gospel book. If you go even today to an Orthodox Jewish synagogue, uh, for some reason, uh, you'll see they have a procession with the Torah scroll at that exact same point uh, in the service. Um, so the, originally, originally, when we're dealing with the book of Acts, when we're dealing with Christianity in the first century, uh, remember we don't have a religion Judaism and a religion Christianity <laughs> in the first century. Uh, but so uh, Christians uh, would go to the synagogue for the reading of the scriptures and preaching on the Sabbath on Saturday. And then they would go gather 
just the Christians on Sunday to celebrate the Eucharist. So these were two separate things. In the second century, when Christians were expelled from the synagogues, that part of the service was brought over and put in front of the liturgy of the Eucharist to give us the divine liturgy like we have it today. Um, so uh, in terms of the, the liturgy of the sacrament and sacrificial rituals, uh, this follows almost step by step. So sacrificial rituals began with a procession uh, in which uh, the, um, the, uh, set the, what was being offered was brought to the altar. Uh, and then the, the prayers were offered. There was pouring of water over the hands, the way the bishop washes his hands, that was done uh, in sacrificial rituals. Uh, the prothesis is mentioned, that's where we get the name of the prothesis. Uh, and the service of the proscomedia is uh, doing two things. In addition to separating out the parts, the part that's going to be consumed by the priest, the part that's going to be uh, consumed by the people, uh, the part that's going to be offered. In addition to that separation taking place, uh, we're also on the, on the patent. Uh, the priest basically builds uh, with the portions he cuts, builds an icon of the divine council, of God's heavenly council. You have Christ at the center uh, as the lamb. You have on his right hand the Theotokos, on his left hand the saints, below the living and the dead. This is an icon of him uh, enthroned uh, in his council in heaven. Uh, but so that's brought to the altar, and, and every, everything we do is directly in line, even, even what we wear is, as priests, as clergy is directly in line with, with what was done in the temple uh, when it existed. Um, so yes, that's, that's, directly, uh, that's directly connected. Uh, do you have any other questions or comments? Or, um, you talked about how oracles would allow themselves to be possessed by a spirit, and this seems like an obvious case of demon possession. Was it as obvious? the people of Israel then, as it is to us Christians today, that this was the case. Uh, yes, it was obvious that it was possession by a spirit, but they didn't necessarily think it was a bad thing, <laughs> the way we do. Um, there are several passages, one in the Apology, and one in, I believe, the Critias, where Socrates, for example, talks about how since his childhood, he's been possessed by a demon who whispers wisdom to his soul. And this was part of him defending himself <laughs> against charges of, of corrupting the youth. Uh, he says, well, no, this wisdom that I've been bringing out has been taught to me by this demon, this uh, divine spirit that, that dwells within me. Um, the, uh, there was seen to be a divine spirit who dwelled within the emperor. Uh, that's the, what's referred to as the, you'll sometimes see, that early Christians were required to sacrifice to the genius of the emperor. Um, the genius of the emperor was this spirit. Plural of that is genii, and that's where like jinn and genie comes from in, uh, in Arabic. Um, but uh, th th this was a, a spirit who indwelt and animated uh, the emperor. That's where we get the term genius. In the ancient world, it meant someone who's possessed. <laughs> Um, so yes, they, they understood that that's what was happening, that a spirit was possessing them. Uh, they didn't understand, they didn't think it was a bad thing uh, because they worshiped these uh, spirits as gods. So these spirits would come and dwell in the idol uh, or they would come and dwell in, uh, in human beings. And the word daemon in Greek is a lot like Elohim in Hebrew. It just means a spirit. It didn't necessarily mean what demon means to us in sort of a negative, in a negative sense. So when St. Paul in 1 Corinthians says what the nations sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons, they wouldn't have disagreed with that. <laughs> That's, uh, they would have said, yeah. Uh, but obviously for St. Paul, uh, if you're sacrificing to anything other than, other than, uh, Yahweh, other than God himself, then you're, 
committing a blasphemy uh, and participating in idolatry. I do not, in fact, play the ukulele. Well, insofar as I think anyone could technically play a ukulele, uh, like I could move my fingers around and just strum it, but uh, uh, not in any uh, not in any uh, real way. Um, since we've got three minutes, uh, just a quick. Since I talked a little bit about. Uh, this is value added, but <laughs> since I since I talked a little bit about the, the fact that this idea that 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 the devil and uh, and a group of angels fell before the creation of the world that that's not really in the scriptures or in the fathers. If you want to read more about that in the fathers, I'd I'd really recommend uh, Saint Andrew of Caesarea his commentary on Revelation. If you read chapter his commentary on chapter twelve. Uh, and uh, St. Gregory the Dialogist uh, wrote a book called his Moralia, like Mor Moral IA, uh, which is really his commentary on Job. Uh, those are both 6th century writers. So even at the 6th century, they already have no idea that, that the devil and all these angels fell before creation. Uh, talk about that. But what people, when I say that that's not in the scriptures, uh, what people will usually bring up to me is Revelation chapter 12. Um, and so just as sort of a brief explanation of what's going on in Revelation chapter 12, uh, the first, right at the beginning of Revelation chapter 12, it mentions the dragon sweeping a third of the stars, uh, a third of the stars out of uh, heaven. And, uh, that is what some people will say, oh, well, that's talking about this fall of the, the devil and a, uh, and uh, yes, that is the correct, in chat is the correct spelling of Moralia and the correct spelling of St. Andrew of Caesarea. Um, actually, it's A-E in Caesarea, but anyway, close enough. Um, so they'll say that that's the verse, uh, that a third of the, a third of the angels fell. Uh, but that's missing something related to what we already talked about. And that's that already, back in, Revelation chapter 5, and then subsequently in the book of Revelation, when St. John witnesses sort of the divine council, sort of the hosts of heaven worshiping God, they're surrounding his throne and worshiping, worshiping him, uh, that uh, you see the, the various angelic beings, the cherubim, the seraphim, the archangels, the angels, and then you also see the 24 elders. You see 24 human elders uh, who are there uh, worshiping, uh, worshiping before the throne. So there's humans who have been incorporated, and there's 24 of them. Now, on one hand, you get the number 24 from the 12 patriarchs, right? The 12 who were the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. But the number 24 and the fact that they're identified as elders should tip us off to something else, uh, which is uh, the elders remember, who were appointed by Moses, there were 70 or 72. And this was in parallel to the 70 or 72 members of, of God's divine council. So if you do a little quick mental math, 24 is one third of, of 72. Three times 24 is 72. Uh, so what St. John sees when he sees the worship of heaven is that one third one third of the heavenly host who's worshiping God is made up of humans uh, who, have been, who have been glorified. And so then when he talks about the fact that a third of the stars or a third of the angels in Revelation 12 had joined the devil in his rebellion over time, right? he's making the point that these humans have replaced, have replaced those fallen those fallen sons of God. They've replaced them uh, in the heavenly host. And so this, is, this idea is what lies behind, for example, St. Athanasius saying that human, being become, human beings become God's small g. This is a big part of where the, the whole theology of theosis comes from. Uh, so, uh, and this is also where our whole theology of sainthood 
the idea of saints as patrons, as intercessors, that they're participating in Christ's rule and his governance of the earth. They're doing that because they've replaced the fallen angelic beings who did it previously, who have been judged and have now been replaced. So as a real blunt example, Aphrodite no longer rules over the city of Thessaloniki, St. Demetrius does. Right? And that's what it means that he's, the, that he's the patron. And so this is how our understanding of the saints' intercessions work, that they're part of Christ's heavenly council, that they stand before him and intercede. Uh, this all comes out of, out of this theology. And uh, there's a couple places where St. John makes that point. One is there with the numbers. He uses some symbolic numbers all through Revelation. One of the places is there in Revelation 12. He also talks about uh, in Revelation chapter 20, during this period when Christ is reigning from heaven before his return, how the saints are not only enthroned with him, but it's, he says that they serve as priests. Well, they're not offering animal sacrifices in heaven. The other thing a priest does is he intercedes for the people. Uh, so that's part of the picture that, that St. John is painting. So that used up our last couple minutes. Um, wasn't really germane to David, but it's related to what we were talking about before. Um, so if anybody has any other questions, I'll answer them. Otherwise, okay. Well, thank you, everybody.